Okay, so let's uh, resume our um, afternoon session. So uh, Ty is going to be the, the chair and just going to briefly introduce uh, the next speaker. So Marco Pavone from, from Stanford. So he's going to give um, a one hour uh, keynote uh, lecture. Um, so just a brief introduction. So Marco is a assistant professor at, at Stanford in uh, aeronautics, uh, astronautics, and he has a number of uh, courtesy appointments in E, in uh, computational mathematical engineering, and the information system systems lab. So he uh, has a broad range of, uh, of research, uh, but in particular, uh, cooperative control of robotic uh, networks. Uh, also, he's doing some research in uh, motion planning, uh, application in space uh, robotics, so obviously relevant for his department and then um, some stochastic uh, optimal uh, control work. So today he's going to talk about uh, learning stabilizable nonlinear dynamics with contraction-based uh, regularization. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for giving this, uh, this talk. It's uh, unusual circumstances, but it, it's, uh, it's great to have you today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. Actually, the talk title has been updated, but the oh, I see. Uh, Sorry, topic I was waiting for the no, program. Um, no problem. <laughs> yes. So, um, my lab is called the Autonomous Systems Lab, and we work on uh, planning and decision-making algorithms for uh, autonomous robotic systems. Basically, we work on uh, computational techniques to make robots capable of uh, making decisions on their own. I apply my work in a variety of settings, and one of the main application domains is autonomous driving, which is indeed going to be the um, main application domain I'm going to discuss today. And specifically, the focus of this talk will be on uh, planning decision-making algorithms for uh, autonomous cars that allow autonomous vehicles to seamlessly interact with the humans on the road, such as pedestrians, bikers, uh, human-driven vehicles, and so on. Specifically, in uh, the movie I'm showing here, you can see how um, in driving, you might have uh, very complex uh, interactions uh, among uh, the agents. This is a case whereby vehicle, there are some vehicles that are trying to merge on the highway. And while the overall intent of everyone, in, everyone involved is quite clear, so basically there are some vehicles that are trying to merge onto the highway, the outcome of this interaction is highly uncertain and is often the result of a complex and sometimes quite aggressive negotiation. Specifically, driving is really an exercise in negotiation and autonomous vehicles should be able to perform such negotiations for safe and efficient driving. In other words, I advocate the key capability for autonomous robots, particularly those that uh, uh, interact with humans, uh, is to be capable of performing a proactive decision-making. That is to be able to proactively interact with other agents to infer their intents, while concurrently exploiting this information to take actions that account for agent uh, responses. Now, my approach toward uh, interactive de decision-making for robotic systems is uh, model-based, whereby a probabilistic uh, model of the interaction is used as a basis for policy construction. This is different from, from model-free approaches whereby uh, human uh, action and responses, relative likelihoods, uh, are only implicitly encoded in a policy that is learned from data. And the claim is that uh, such a decoupling between uh, uh, models and uh, decision-making policies built by leveraging those models uh, is crucial in order to achieve a level of interpretability that is uh, often not possible with model-free approaches. Explicitly, the first step in order to build uh, a model-based uh, approach for interactive decision-making is to build uh, a module that, allow, that allows a robot to infer the human intent, that is the possible future uh, uh, human actions. 
and my work is uh, guided by three by sorry by five main considerations first of all we want for 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 the purposes uh, of decision making we want uh, an intent prediction module that allows us to predict the intent of a human conditional on future robot uh, actions second we are targeting uh, decision making problems on a time scale of about uh, one second it is, this is different from a traditional decision making that reasons about uh, macro actions that happen at the level of multiple seconds, such as uh, which uh, route should they choose or should they switch lane or not. And this is also different from uh, low level collision avoidance that usually relies on reactive policies and need to reason at the millisecond level for safety. Third, at this uh, level of decision making, uh, the uncertainty in uh, uh, human intent predictions is uh, highly multimodal, corresponding to the uh, significantly different uh, uh, future um, human actions. For example, here in the figure, the white car represents the car that is driven by human. The, so, sorry, the white car represents the robotic vehicle the blue car represents the uh, car driven by human. So if the uh, robot uh, accelerates, then the human might either accelerate or decelerate. And this corresponds to two drastically different modes of uh, operation that we want to capture in our uncertainty modeling work. Fourth, we want uh, intent prediction models that are history dependent. They're basically taking into account the history of an interaction. This is important in order to uncover latent behavior such as alertness or aggressiveness. And finally, we would like to have a modeling approach that is as interpretable as possible in order to ease the bugging and increase confidence in this technology. Now, um, most of the approaches for intent modeling uh, rely on uh, a so-called ontological approach or a theory of mind approach, whereby uh, one postulates some structure on uh, how humans make uh, their own decisions. For example, in terms of a cost function that a human uh, would postulate is trying to optimize. And then the idea is to learn from data that cost function. Now, the problem is that uh, in general, humans are not cooperative nor adversarial and such a fuzziness of behavior is difficult to reconcile with uh, a theory of mind approach that is ultimately rooted in game theory so what we did in my lab in the past couple of years has been to investigate a completely different approach that is phenomenological whereby we try to model directly the probabilistic structure of an interaction without reasoning about the underlying motivations of a human. This approach, since uh, uh, does not postulate any structure, requires uh, more data. And to that purpose, we built an interactive driving uh, simulator in my lab, whereby I had the students driving side by side in a variety of uh, interactive driving scenarios, for example, lane changing, lane weaving, on a highway to gather data. Explicitly, we harness tools from generative uh, modeling. The way that our work differs from a traditional generative modeling work is that we are interested in prediction models that are not only conditional on the past, but that, but that also reasons about uh, what a human could do con contingent on a future uh, robot action. Specifically, <clears throat> we try to learn from data a condition probability distribution, P, that gives us uh, probabilistically the next uh, human action, say uh, in terms of acceleration or speed. Subscript H means uh, action of a human, conditional on the history of an interaction, X, for example, might represent the relative states or relative, relative positions or relative speeds in the previous uh, T time steps. And the past 
control actions. For example, the past uh, speed values or acceleration values in the previous t time steps uh, enacted by the human agent. And conditional on a candidate uh, uh, robot action. Subscript R stands for robot. So, in other words, we're trying to learn a condition probability distribution that gives us uh, probabilistically uh, information about a future robot action, condition on the history of interaction, and on uh, a candidate uh, robot next action. Conditioning on the history of an interaction allows us to uncover latent behavior such as aggressiveness or alertness while uh, conditioning on a future robot action allows us to capture the interactive aspects of an interaction. In practice, we use a recurrent conditional variational, variational autoencoder model to learn such a distribution. And then the, the end result is as follows. So here in this plot, I'm showing on the um, I'm showing on the x-axis uh, uh, time and uh, on the y-axis longitudinal acceleration. A solid line means uh, uh, data uh, that has happened in the past. A dashed line represents the future. Red uh, represents data with respect to the human vehicle. Blue represents data <clears throat> with respect to the uh, robotic vehicle. So here we're considering the case whereby in the previous uh, uh, half a second or so, both the robotic vehicle and the human vehicle had a zero acceleration, so they were, they were going at constant speed. And then the way we use this generative model uh, is as follows. Suppose that the robot were to enact uh, uh, a control strategy whereby it first accelerates, then it costs at the constant speed, and then it decelerates. Then we sample condition on this uh, action profile, uh, possible human responses. And here you see a bunch of uh, possible responses. Many of them correspond to the case whereby the human would uh, decelerate if the vehicle were to accelerate and trying to change lane. But in some cases, the human might be aggressive and might accelerate as well. So the way we use this model then is to build a library of uh, motion primitives, primitives for the robotic vehicle. In actuality, we consider about uh, 4,000 action sequences. And for each, each action sequence, uh, it basically corresponds to a different concatenation of accelerations and decelerations for the robot. And then for each possible action sequence for the robot, we sample by using the conditional variational autoencoder model, a, a distribution of a possible human responses. In actuality, we sample for each planning cycle about 100,000 human responses. We can do this in real time by leveraging a parallel computing. Basically, this uh, approach is highly parallelizable and we implement it in the GPU, which allows us to um, uh, sample 100,000 responses in about uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. So what we do is then to score each motion primitive according to a cost function that accounts for the desire of avoiding collision, obviously, but also trying to fulfill a task as soon as possible. For example, changing lane or negotiating an intersection and so on. We select the best motion primitive according to such a cost function. We drive the first chunk of it, and then we replan in a receding horizon fashion at about three, four hertz. Now, the way we score a motion primitive is by looking at uh, the expectation of an aggregate cost function. Of course, expectation reflects a risk neutral assessment of a future human behavior. So it is certainly of interest to consider more sophisticated uh, uh, cost functions whereby we embed uh, a notion of risk sensitivity. So basically we try to reason about future actions by also accounting for what happens in the tail of uh, the distribution for human responses. Now, going from uh, um, um, an um, average type of analysis to a risk sensitive uh, decision making problem is uh, complicated both from a computational standpoint and a modeling standpoint. And I won't discuss this further. But if you're interested, 
You may find uh, some uh, thoughts about this problem in a paper that I had a couple of years ago with one of my postdocs, which was really focused on uh, risk-sensitive models for robot decision-making. Let's see how this uh, machinery works. In order to test this machinery, we uh, go back to our interactive driving simulator and uh, we perform a, a human in the loop tests, whereby the uh, white vehicle again portrays a, a robotic vehicle that drives by running the algorithm that I just explained, both in terms of intent prediction and decision making, while the blue vehicle is uh, driven by a real human. The task that I'm showing here entails uh, changing, exchanging a, a lane before the road splits. So, he, and remember that the white vehicle is the robotic vehicle. So here you can see that some interesting behaviors emerge, like for example, the robotic vehicle, the white one, trying to nudge a little bit on the other lane in order to disambiguate the intent of the human and uh, um, perform a decision accordingly. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the predictions from the CVAE-based model in terms of both longitudinal acceleration and uh, longitudinal uh, velocity. Again, all the lines that you see here are uh, possible human responses sampled uh, by using the CVA model. All of this looks promising until disaster happens. Specifically, here I'm showing a case whereby the blue vehicle, the human vehicle, defies our predictions in, in that it decides to swerve into the uh, robotic vehicle. So this is certainly concerning because obviously with autonomous vehicles, we want to be as safe as possible. So we, I want to dig a little bit deeper into uh, this problem. And I claim that uh, this problem has a three main root causes. First of all, we are relying on a probabilistic model in order to compute decisions for the autonomous car. And probabilistic models rely on guesses. And so sometimes you might guess it's wrong. Uh, the same way that a human might guess, uh, might mistakenly guess something about what other humans around him or her can do. Second, at this level of decision-making, we are incorporating collision avoidance as a penalty in a, uh, within an aggregate cost function. So this is basically just, this is just one term that is weighted against uh, many other terms that, for example, model task fulfillment. So, and notoriously aggregate cost functions might cause conflicting, conflicting objectives. And third, even though we leverage GPU, GPUs, we can uh, replan at about three, four hertz, which is ultimately too slow to ensure safety. So the key question at stake here is, uh, how do we integrate safety assurance within a probabilistic performance-centric planning framework? Specifically, uh, one of the key open problems in autonomous driving, and I would say in robot autonomy in general, is how to properly trade the safety with respect to efficiency. Explicitly, um, probabilistic models for decision-making aim at uh, promoting efficiency, often at the cost of safety. Conversely, um, uh, low-level controllers try usually reason uh, in a worst case uh, sense and try to promote safety at the expense of efficiency. So the question is, how do we properly trade off the safety properties of low-level controller, uh, meaning more reactive controllers, with the efficiency properties of uh, high-level planners that reason more probabilistically? Ideally, you would like to be here where the start is, where you have maximum safety and efficiency, but this is not really possible. So the question is, how do we properly trade off between uh, uh, the performance in terms of safety of low-level planners and the performance in terms of uh, smooth negotiation that is uh, provided by high-level planners. Explicitly, the, the challenge is how to properly glue uh, a probabilistic uh, planner with uh, a low-level reactive collision avoidance controller. 
And this is often, uh, and this is an aspect that is often overlooked both in the theory and in practice in the field of robot autonomy. Now, let me discuss first how one can modify the low level controller in order to align it better with the performance of a high level probabilistic planner. And then I will discuss how the two levels of the control hierarchy can be better merged in order to promote smooth negotiations that are safe. Let's start with the low level controller. There are several approaches out there to promote safety at the lowest level of the control hierarchy. Of course, some examples include the potential functions, constraint optimization, libraries of emergency maneuvers that you would enact if something is going wrong and so on. But the key point is that in all these techniques, the interaction with a sentient agent is not generally accounted for. And this is in contrast uh, with the desire of uh, having uh, a low level controller that can uh, properly interact with a high level planner that is trying to promote smooth negotiations. So in my work, I uh, leverage uh, uh, reachability theory that allow us to reason about uh, interaction even at the lowest level of the control hierarchy. So at the level of uh, the collision avoidance controller. Now, typically, reachability is understood in the sense of a forward reachability, whereby here the blue vehicle represents the uh, human vehicle and the red vehicle represents the robotic vehicle. I was saying that uh, uh, reachability typically is interpreted in a forward sense, whereby the dynamics of an agent are propagated forward in time, and the resulting set, sorry, the resulting set is uh, used as a static obstacle. And then the trajectory for the robot is planned in such a way that it does not intersect with uh, uh, that set. This certainly um, ensures safety, but, is, uh, but it is usually too conservative for um, practical applications. Basically, the uh, forward reachable set uh, very quickly becomes very large, which would force the robot to always stop uh, outside of the road, which is clearly undesirable. So what we do in my work is instead uh, leveraging a backward reachability notion, whereby the joint dynamics between the robot and the uh, human are backward propagated in time in order to account for the closed loop interaction between uh, the two agents. Such uh, a closed loop notion of uh, reachability is much less conservative. And uh, at the end, it provides us with a set referred to as a backward reachable sets that encodes a notion of uh, relative states that you don't want to put your system into. Otherwise, uh, if the human were to act uh, adversarially, you would have uh, no control action at your disposal in order to get out of the danger zone. Basically, for example, if you're familiar with uh, riding a motorbike, you don't want to put yourself uh, in a situation whereby you cannot recover from in case of uh, uh, other agents around you driving carelessly. For example, you don't want to get boxed in because if someone then becomes uh, uh, distracted, then it might uh, collide with you and you have uh, no emergency escape. Now, the backward reachable set uh, more formally can be defined as the set of void states for which there exist strategies for the human that for all inputs of the robot will lead to collisions. And obviously you would like the system not to enter such a, back, such a set. Uh, computationally, these sets can, set can be computed by solving a partial differential equation referred to as the hamilton jacobi isaacs equation that provides the backward reachable set as the sub-zero level set of uh, the solution to uh, such a partial differential equation uh, referred to as the value function and denoted here with uh, B. So basically we solve the PDE, the solution is given by the value function V, then the backward reachable set is simply the set that is obtained by taking the sub-zero level set of the value function V. In traditional backward reachability theory, then the strategy is to resort to an optimal controller U star whenever the system is near to a backward reachable set. 
and the optimal control u star is given by the control for the robot u r that ensures that uh, the value function increases uh, at the quickest possible rate under the worst possible action from the human. So in other words, uh, the control u star r is the control that allows the robot to get out of the unsafe set uh, as quick as possible under worst case behavior from the human. So as I said, traditionally in backward usability theory, uh, control is, so basically we switch to the control u star r whenever close, oops, read the message. So the question, should I answer the question now or at the end of the talk? Uh, it's up to you. You're, you're welcome to answer it now if you feel like it, if it, if it fits on this slide. So the question is, if humans can uh, imitate uh, getting close to avoid sets to get uh, a road advantage, will it become a common best response for humans uh, near uh, probabilistic models? And, <clears throat> And the answer is uh, basically yes. I mean, uh, as in a normal driving, a human might try to um, enact, uh, uh, basically try to game the system, trying to get uh, a road advantage. And unfortunately, there is no countermeasure against a human trying to act uh, adversarially. Here, the countermeasure would be for some policy enforcement to ensure that a human uh, would not uh, try to game the system. But this is beyond really the scope of what can be done here. I mean, the most you can do is really trying to um, maximize performance as um, well as possible, assuming that the human are not, are not trying to game in the system and optimizing safety in the case a human is uh, distracted uh, or loses control for whatever reason. Let me know if this answers the questions and in case we can talk more about it uh, offline. So going back to the uh, discussion about uh, uh, the reachability based controller, here I'm showing a, a, oops, a movie whereby the red vehicle is the robotic vehicle, the green vehicle is the human operated vehicle. This pear shaped uh, set represents the backward reachable uh, set um, it's pear shaped because it reflects basically the dynamics of the uh, robotic vehicle. Here you can see that at some point the human acts erratically, swerves into the robotic vehicle, and then the robotic vehicle switches to the Hamilton Jacobi controller and uh, stops the vehicle and uh, ensures that the vehicle gets out of the road. This is certainly a safe behavior, but it's not very efficient. If every time that uh, a human acts uh, aggressively, maybe because of distraction, maybe intentionally, and the robot were to uh, stop, that would be from a mobility standpoint, uh, highly inefficient. So the question then is how do we better merge um, the hamilton Jacobi controller with uh, probabilistic decision-making module in such a way that uh, we have a a more balanced trade-off between safety and efficiency. And the key idea here is to reason in terms of safety-preserving controls. Safety-preserving controls is the set of controls you are for the robots that ensure that the value function is non-decreasing. So basically the set is the set of uh, controls that ensure that uh, we do not make the situation worse. Now, among these controls, there is the optimal control U star R, which is the one that ensures that uh, uh, we um, um, ensure that the value function is increasing at the quickest possible rate. But here we relax that constraint. We more broadly reason in terms of controls that ensure that the value function is not decreasing. Now, this set is a highly uh, convex. So in order to enable computation in real time, we linearize the set around the uh, operating condition. So the end approach then entails solving uh, an 
MPC, model predictive control problem, whereby the idea is uh, the following. You are given a reference trajectory, a desired trajectory provided by, the, by a high level probabilistic planner. For example, the one that I explained before. Then we want to compute controls such that uh, such a trajectory is uh, tracked as closely as possible. So th these terms, the delta, basically portray differences with respect to the reference values. We want to keep those differences as small as possible, both in terms of longitudinal error, lateral error, and, and uh, heading error. We want to do so by using as little as possible control effort. And we want to solve this problem with respect to linearized vehicle dynamics, stable handling envelope constraints, control constraints, the specific forms of this equation is not so important. What really matters is to say that we really consider um, uh, fairly sophisticated models for the vehicle. With the key addition of an instantaneous interaction safety constraint that constrains the controls to belong to the class of safety preserving controls whenever the system is close to the backward reachable set. So this is a much smoother way to give control to the hamilton Jacobi uh, reachability controller by uh, adding uh, uh, such a controller as a constraints with respect to a set of controls as opposed to a hard switch to a very specific optimal control. To sum up, the full decision-making control stack comprises uh, three main parts. On the one hand, we have an interaction planner that reason probabilistically and, compute, and uh, provides uh, reference trajectories, desired trajectories for the robotic vehicle by leveraging uh, a CVAE-based uh, intent uh, 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 prediction model. Then we have a reachability cache that uh, encodes uh, the notion of uh, relative states that are unsafe in the sense of a hamilton jacobi reachability. Now, in general, in general, solving the partial differential equation that allows us to compute those relative uh, unsafe states is very complicated. But fortunately, that can be done offline. So online, one has to do a simple lookup search, which means that uh, we can uh, um, use a reachability cache in real time. And finally, we merge the information from the interaction planner and the reachability cache uh, into the MPC tracking controller that I have uh, illustrated uh, before and compute uh, and then we compute a set uh, we, we compute uh, actions that ensure that the executed uh, um, trajectory is uh, minimally uh, changed in order to uh, comply with the safety constraints in the sense of uh, hamilton jacobi uh, reachability if you are far from the backward reachable set then we just use the desired trajectory for, from the interaction planner. Otherwise, we compute a set of uh, control actions that are minimally invasive that allow the robot to drive as close as possible to the desired trajectory from the uh, high-level interaction planner to the extent that this is safe with respect to the uh, hamilton jacobi uh, safety constraint. So we tested uh, these uh, uh, decision-making control stack in a simulation, but we also tested it on uh, uh, full-scale self-driving cars that are available in the center at the Kodarak, the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. One of the vehicles that we have is called X1, which is a full-scale drive-by-wire vehicle, whereby we implemented uh, all the algorithms uh, from perception to intent prediction to stochastic decision-making, to um, hamilton jacobi reachability to the MPC tracking controller that I mentioned before, all on the vehicle, so all is run on board at about 100 hertz. And the role of the human vehicle is taken by an RC car that is uh, remotely controlled by uh, a student. The reason why we use an RC car is that uh, basically we tell students to drive uh, in a crazy way in order to abuse the algorithm and to see uh, how we expose any uh, possible weaknesses of uh, our approach. So for safety reasons, we use an R R RC car. So here the task that I'm going to show is to again uh, uh, exchange lane between the self-driving car and the RC car. 
On the uh, bottom left side, you can see the view from the top. The red vehicle is the robotic vehicle. The blue vehicle is the RC car. At the beginning, the um, oops. At the beginning, the human is driving uh, nominally. The lines that you see here, the predictions. But then the human decides to swerve into the vehicle. At that point, uh, the um, safety constraint kicks in. But as you see now, instead of having the overreactive uh, maneuver I showed before that uh, you would have if you were to switch uh, abruptly to the safety control, we have a much smoother uh, trajectory. So at the end of the day, the interaction then is quite uneventful, um, which is really what the objective of uh, um, this work is. But of course, there is a lot of combination that goes beyond this because there is a proper exchange of responsibilities between intent prediction, decision-making and uncertainty, and low-level um, collision avoidance. So let's go back to the plot I had before, where I was making the point of how do we find methodologies to properly trade the safety versus with efficiency. The left plot is a conceptual plot. On the right, I'm showing experimental data, some data from the road. Green means uh, um, our uh, control and decision-making stack. Red uh, uh, represents a decision-making stack whereby whenever the system is near to the backward reachable set, we make a hard switch to the safety controller. So we give up uh, um, the responsibility of uh, the high-level planner, we discount it. We just do what the uh, low-level controller tells us to do. While the blue, <coughs> sorry, corresponds to an optimistic uh, approach whereby we only use the high-level planner and we do not consider a low-level collision avoidance module. As you can see, our approach provides a, a satisfactory trade-off between a pessimistic approach that only relies on hard switch to collision avoidance and the blue approach that uh, only reason probabilistically it does not account for interaction at the level of uh, reactive collision avoidance. Our current work is currently aimed at uh, two uh, complementary directions. On the one hand, we are scaling up this work to reason about the uh, interactions with uh, multiple agents. And in the other direction, we're working on uh, imbuing logical structure into uh, predictions. And I will spend a couple of words uh, on each one of these directions. First of all, we have been with leveraging techniques from uh, spatial temporal graphs we have been working on extending the intent prediction uh, approach based on uh, uh, CVEs to uh, multiple agents belonging to different semantic classes, like for example, uh, pedestrians, other cars, possibly even automated cars and so on. But most importantly, we have extended the model in order to be able to uh, provide predictions that are conditional on heterogeneous data. So in the model that I discussed before, we were conditioning our predictions with respect to dynamical information, say relative states, how close the robotic vehicle was to a human vehicle, or uh, relative speeds. But of course, there is much more information that you can use in order to sharpen your predictions. For example, you can condition on a map of the scene providing information about road geometry, for example, or you can even condition on the silhouette of the people. For example, a person that is looking at the vehicle is providing a, a much, a very specific information with respect to a person that is distracted and is looking at the, at the smartphone. So now we can account for such a heterogeneity in data. In particular, accounting for, some heterog for such heterogeneity is quite important. So here I'm showing uh, um, results by using a data sets of uh, um, uh, uh, specific to autonomous driving that is called the new scenes. New scenes is a data set of sensor readings on real roads that has been put together by an autonomous driving company called uh, New Autonomy in the city of uh, Boston. And uh, this data set uh, accounts for um, uh, a vast class of uh, sensor readings and accounts for interaction with uh, 
several different agents of uh, many different types, from pedestrians to bikers to cars and so on. Here on the left hand side, you can see predictions without uh, uh, map encoding, so without giving the model uh, the opportunity to reason about road geometry. The solid line, the black one, represents our predictions. The bubbles represent our confidence levels. The dashed white lines represent the ground truth. So here you can see that there is some offsets. Well, if you account for conditioning with respect to road geometry, so basically with respect to the map of the scene, then the predictions are snapped back in, onto the ground truth uh, to a level that is really remarkable, which to human makes much more sense, right? For example, in this case, the red vehicle is uh, turning. And before we were predicting with a relatively high likelihood that the vehicle could have invaded the other lane, which obviously if you have some notion of the road geometry and rules of the road, that is very unlikely. And this is more correctly captured by this refined model. I talked about rules of the road. Indeed, uh, the other uh, direction that we are pursuing in my lab is uh, how do we embed logical reasoning within uh, data-driven neural network uh, models, specifically for the purposes of uh, intent prediction. And the main result is that uh, we have uh, recently um, um, devised uh, a methodology to represent uh, logic uh, languages, in particular signal temporal logic, in the same computational um, paradigm that is used by uh, deep learning models. Basically, we can represent the STL formula within the language, language of uh, computational graphs. This allows us uh, uh, a couple of things. First, it allows us to jointly train a neural network model with respect to um, performance and uh, robustness uh, with respect to a signal temporal logic formula in order to endow the model with uh, uh, some notion of uh, interpretability. And second, it allows us to verify uh, that the output of a neural net model, for example, satisfies some uh, logical tools. Explicitly uh, or concretely, uh, one of the uh, applications of this methodology is to allow our uh, CDAE-based models to also condition predictions with respect to logical information, such as, for example, rules of the road. Obviously, as humans, when we make our predictions, we also reason about uh, what the rules of the road are. We know that the stop sign, typically people tend to stop. We know that the crosswalk, people, typically people tend to cross the road. So we want to make sure that our prediction models can account for that information, which is really logical information. That's why we're doing all this work in, in order to embed logical reasoning within neural net models. Finally, and uh, to conclude, um, the model-based approach that uh, I have uh, discussed is uh, uh, an example of designing a model for the specific purposes of decision making and control. And indeed in my lab, we are very interested in understanding the foundations to make sure that the model that we learn are cognizant of the downstream control application. To be more concrete, let's consider, for example, the task of a trajectory planning for a robot, such as an aerial vehicle. So the idea is that we want to learn a model for an aerial vehicle, say a quadrotor, in such a way that we can use that model to plan a trajectory that the aerial vehicle can follow. Now, the typical approach uh, in model-based reinforcement learning is to uh, gather data in terms of states, controls, next states. Once you have enough data, set up a regression problem in order to fit a dynamics model to the data and then iterate this procedure. Now, the problem with this approach, uh, and this is also reflected in experiments, is that the model that you get uh, might give rise to trajectories that the robots cannot really follow. In other words, in this uh, naive model-based reinforcement learning approach, that th there is nothing that says that the model that we learn is useful for the purposes of control. 
So the research question that we have uh, uh, addressed is, can we add constraints to the learning procedure in order to learn a dynamics model as hat that not only fits the data well, but also is a cognizant of the downstream control application. Specifically, uh, the model can be used to generate trajectories that are uh, stabilizable and in particular can be tracked by using a, a feedback controller by an aerial vehicle or any basically robotic vehicle. In practice, we um, uh, model these stabiliz stabiliz stabilization constraints by using techniques from nonlinear control theory, in particular from contraction theory, that gives us uh, sufficient conditions to ensure that uh, uh, a model can generate trajectories that uh, uh, can be stabilized by using a feedback controller. In a nutshell, uh, the end result is a methodology that allows us to prune the hypothesis space with respect to the different models for the dynamical systems in such a way that uh, we compute models that are tailored to a downstream task. And here again, as an example, I discussed it as downstream task, the task of uh, trajectory generation and trajectory following. We have tested uh, the algorithms on uh, um, a physical robot in my lab, specifically a quadrotor. So here the task was to follow um, um, a trajectory that looks like an eight. And we pretend that we don't know the um, dynamics of a quadrotor. Of course, we know the dynamics of a quadrotor, but for example, the dynamics when the quadrotor are very close to the ground are much uh, more poorly characterized due to ground effects. So by using a, a constrained model-based reinforcement learning approach, we are able to learn a model for the quadrotor that allowed us to more or less follow an eight, uh, a figure eight trajectory. While if we use a, a standard regression uh, model to learn the dynamics without uh, stabiliz stabilizability constraints, then what we get is a model that generates a trajectory that the vehicle cannot really follow and then the quadrotor uh, crashes very quickly. So this is a very uh, explicit manifestation of how important it is to imbue structure in uh, model-based reinforcement learning, specifically for the purposes of uh, uh, control and decision-making. To conclude, I presented uh, uh, an approach for human intent prediction for the purposes of uh, robot decision-making that relies on uh, uh, sampling um, a model of uh, human action responses. And then I discuss how such a probabilistic uh, way of reasoning about uh, human interactions can be uh, robustified, robustified by gluing a high level probabilistic uh, planning module with a low level um, deterministic uh, control module through the lens of uh, hamilton jacobi reachability in a way that uh, we obtain a, a full stack um, control and decision making model that is uh, safe. At the same time, uh, we have a minimal loss in terms of performance with respect to a high level stochastic planner. More broadly, in my lab, we are very interested in learning models for the purposes of control and decision making. So the underlying idea throughout this talk was to be the models that are really cognizant of the downstream control applications. And most recently, as I discussed toward the end of this talk, I've been looking at ways to very explicitly infuse in uh, model learning uh, either constraints or um, logical structure in order to prune the hypothesis space and get models that are as useful as possible for controls. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you so sorry. much, Marco. I'd like to do, oh. thank very quickly all my collaborators, including my PhD students, uh, Karen Boris, Ed, who is now Waymo, Mo, who's a postdoc, he's now in Canada. And part of this work was done in collaboration with the uh, professor Chris Gerdes, 
who is the other co-director for the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. Great, Marco, thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, at this time, we have, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I'll open it up to the, to the audience first. Does uh, anybody have a question for Marco? Either through chat or through speaking up? And of course, if some <clears throat> questions uh, arise uh, after the talk later today or maybe the rest of the week, feel free to send me an email. And all the codes for the work I presented here is available on my GitHub page. Great. So I guess I'll jump in with somewhat of yeah. a constraint question when it, when it comes to the uh, to the lane changing and the reaction of the humans. So, yeah. I mean, in some ways that's a sociology problem, right, too, because yes. depending on where you are in the world, where you are in the state, the, the reaction of people is going to be different. So is, is there a, a sense of constraint that you could add to the problem to kind of change the probability of reactions? Yeah, well, that actually is exactly the motivation behind our choice of a phenomenological model. Uh, driving styles are so geographically local that uh, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a model that then you can transfer somewhere else. So we wanted to learn, we wanted to provide it with, a, I mean, we wanted to introduce a methodology that allowed us to fine tune uh, an intent uh, prediction model by leveraging additional data that is very uh, geography specific. So um, actually, the cons I, I prefer to think about constraints with respect to that information that is uh, well-defined, such as uh, road geometry, um, rules of the road, and so on. But I prefer to leave the sociological aspect more to the data, because it's very difficult to capture in any conceivable language that you can think of. So in my model, I really try to separate, in a way, the sociological part. Uh, we're not in the business of psychology in my lab. So we want just to learn the sociological aspect that is useful from the perspective of decision making. And from a careful review of the state of the art, we couldn't find anything that was really analytical that allowed us to do what we really want to do. But at the same time, we don't, we don't want to discard the structure, the structure that we can fully characterize, such as a road geometry, uh, rules of the road, and so on. So that's why we converged toward uh, this conditional variational autoencoder model or phenomenological model in general, whereby we can separate structured information from purely data-driven information. Okay, that's great. But yes, I agree with you. I'm originally from Italy. Even in Italy, just to give you an anecdote, if you go to the north of Italy and then you blink your, um, your lights, that means uh, I'm kind to you and allow you to pass in front of me. If you go to the south of Italy, so like Sicily, and you blink your lights, that is meant as an aggressive sign. It means uh, do not dare to cross in front, of me, in front of me because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to run over you. So just to give you an idea how in the same country you can have a mm -hmm. complete, and then you have a full blending of uh, uh, this type of uh, behaviors. How can you encode that mathematically? That's really where a data-driven solution would shine. But on the other hand, obviously you still want to account for geometry information, dynamical information, logical information, so that what the model that as, uh, I presented is trying to do. There are a couple of questions on the- Are they coming chat? straight to you? So one is from Marta in the North, we're very polite. <laughs> I agree, I'm actually from Torino. But my family lives in Sicily and my wife is Sicilian, so I cannot comment further on it. And um, any ideas on how to include the notion of common knowledge uh, into uh, constraints? Yeah, that's a great question. In a way, um, the very quick discussion that I had about uh, including uh, logical constraints into neural net models uh, was trying to get uh, to that objective. Uh, but it's very primary work, and I think it's a very exciting future directions for work. If you're interested, we have a uh, um, very recent paper that we have submitted along this line, 
So feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the paper. Okay, yeah, I think you're getting the chat direct to you, so I'm not seeing them. Were there any more in the chat? Yeah, there is a question from Anton, which is uh, there are a couple of private questions. Well, the question from, well, the comment from Atta was directed to Aruma. Yes, okay. Um, no, yeah. We still have five minutes if anybody wants to, uh, if anybody has any more questions. Or well, I have one, one, yeah, one question from Harry. Um, just to, can you give us some sort of the comments on the training time uh, for like, you know, just two um, human machine interaction and also some sort of the general way where multiple agent uh, just, you know, collaborating each other uh, for kind of the constructing the uh, some safety model? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So uh, as I mentioned in the talk, in the phenomenological model that I discussed, we do not place uh, any assumptions on how humans make their own decisions. So we're not postulating, for example, that humans are uh, uh, trying to optimize a cost function and then the learning task will be to uh, infer that cost function from data. We're not doing that. Which means that uh, our approach is much more data hungry. Um, mm -hmm. and so what we bet on is that uh, with the wealth of data that is now available, thanks uh, to several companies that are now uh, driving millions of miles on the roads in order to validate their systems, we do actually have that data. But to be more concrete, uh, in order to train the model that we used in order to um, test our methodology on the lane weaving uh, example, we used about uh, 2000 uh, examples from uh, human interaction scenarios. So you can then have a, a ballpark about uh, more or less how much data you will need for each conceivable interaction scenario. So the idea is that you will use uh, uh, several thousands interaction uh, samples uh, and then depending on the geography, you will gather a few, a few more in order to tailor your model to that specific uh, geographical uh, region. But yes, um, these models tend to be much more uh, data hungry. Uh, so if you have limited data, then the best thing that you can do is to use an ontological approach such as inference reinforcement learning. But what we bet on is that uh, now all the data is indeed available. And actually a number of uh, autonomous driving companies have been uh, talking to are uh, considering or even implementing the methods that I discussed uh, today. So Thank there's you. a very nice paper from uh, Anka Dragon, who is a professor at UC Berkeley, that compares uh, ontological to phenomenological models. And she clearly shows how um, uh, one shines relative to the other, depending on the data regime that you are, whether you are in a limited data setting or in a, uh, the, in a setting where you have a lot of data. Fortunately, with the autonomous cars, you tend to have uh, now a lot of data. The other house on my lab is working on space robotics. Now that's a setting whereby, for example, you have very limited data. Uh, now, you don't have humans on other planets, so actually in time prediction is not that big of a deal. But you know, for other tasks such as dynamic learning, then in those settings, you have to be very careful uh, that uh, um, your uh, model learning pipelines are really data efficient. That's great. Well, thank you again, Marco. I, 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 uh, I thought it was an awesome talk and, and we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. If you have any additional questions or you're interested in some of the papers, feel free to uh, reach out to me. It was a pity that we couldn't meet uh, in person, but I hope that uh, we'll have another edition of this symposium whereby we'll be able to meet and, I don't know, Yes, absolutely. Together. absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank right, you very much. So Have a nice day.